Thanks. Okay, we're now live. Thanks, Katie. So we're now live. So welcome to everybody uh, to this last meeting of this committee before the election. Um, I'm going to go through the usual procedure of asking everybody here whether they are present. Um, and if you could just either indicate that when I call your name. So uh, I'm present. Um, Lance, are you here? <coughs> Lance, present. Thanks, Lance. Uh, Chris Carter, I can see you, Chris. Uh, confirmed, Chairman, I'm here. <laughs> uh, uh, Councillor Chowdhury, Ch Charles, you're, you're here, I've seen yes, you. Yes, present. Thank you. Mark, Mark you're here. Uh, present. Rod Cooper, you're here. Yes, good morning. Uh, Jane, Jane Frankham, is she here yet? No, she hasn't joined, Chairman. Okay, we'll wait. Yeah, we'll work on to it. Andrew, Andrew Gibson, you're here. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pal Hare, you're here. I've seen you here. Well, I'm present, Chairman. Thank you. And Councillor Harrison, David, you're here substituting for Roger. I am. Yes, Chairman. Yeah. Thanks, David. Uh, Councillor House, Keith, you're here. I most certainly am. Yeah, <laughs> I can't see you, but I can hear you. Um, Councillor Gary Hughes. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning. Uh, Wayne Irish, Councillor, you're here. Good morning, Chairman. Present, yes. Thank you. Uh, Neville Penman, Councillor Penman, you here? Uh, Councillor Penman's not joined yet, Chairman. Right, OK. <clears throat> and Stephen, Councillor Philpott, Stephen, you're here. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Stephen. Right, so you, uh, you, you forgot me, Chairman. Who have I forgot? Oh, sorry. You forgot me. Alexis, you weren't on my. Oh, yeah, Alexis. Good, good to Hello, see you. Hello, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> right, so we're so we're all here, apart from um, Neville Penman and um, Jane Frank at the moment. So just to remind you that. It should be a reasonably straightforward meeting. Uh, any decisions we make are done with a roll call if it's necessary to do so. Um, and can I make sure, can you all switch off your mics unless called upon to speak? And can you be present for the whole of the item on the agenda uh, to, to enable you to be able to vote? Um, so I'm now gonna work through the agenda um, the first item on the agenda is apologies, and that's Councillor Price with Councillor Harrison here as deputy. <clears throat> Declarations of interest, we normally deal with those um, as and when they arise, when the item comes up. Uh, minutes of previous meeting, I'm sure you've all read the minutes. Are they a correct record of what went on? Uh, and are you happy for me to sign them whenever I have the, can get back to do so? Or are there any amendments you wish to make? Chairman, I move. You're happy? Right. Um, <clears throat> deputations, we've got one deputation this morning. That's on item number six. Um, there's a hand up, I see. Does there somebody who wish to speak? Good, good morning, Chairman. Um, yes, sorry, it's, it's James uh, Hammond here, legal oh, officer. James, yeah. I just noticed Councillor Frankham has joined the meeting. So we, before we start the um, the item, if you could just confirm her presence as well, um, just so we can be clear about the voting later. Thank you. That's all. Thanks, James. Jane, you're here. Can you just confirm you are here? Sorry, I apologise. Um, I'm definitely here. <laughs> no, good. Thanks, Jane. OK, right. Where were we? Um, so, yeah, deputations, item number four. Um, so we've got one deputy speaking on the Samuel Colby College. Um, chairman's announcements. I have no announcements at the moment, so we will move on and go straight into 
item number six, which is the application for the uh, specialist sports college to be built on land east of the existing uh, college at Samuel Cody uh, Sports College in Farnborough. Amy Dales is going to present this item. So I'll, Amy, could you um, take down your presentation and present it to the committee? Thanks, Amy. Thank you, Chairman. I will share my screen with you all now. Are you all able to see that? Yep. <clears throat> Good morning, members. So this is, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. So this development is on vacant and surplus land to the east of the existing Samuel Cody Specialist Sports College to form a new 90 place SEM campus with associated car park, play areas and sports facilities in Farnborough. <clears throat> and just for clarity, uh, SEM uh, is social, emotional and mental health needs. OK, so just some context to the site here. Um, you can see from this map the sort of surrounding residential nature of the site. Um, you can also see here the existing school campus. And then this red lined area is the proposal site, uh, which is 2.49 hectares in area. Um, I've also included here this pink hashed area uh, is the area of historic landfill, um, which is the reason for the potential contact contaminated land uh, issues with the site. Um, you can also see um, the uh, Ballantyne Road here, which is the access to the site, which leads to the main road there, Mayfield Road. <coughs> um, so just another little location plan that's slightly clearer to show um, the nearest residences here are, are at the north of the site. And again, you can see to the south and east here, um, the open playing field areas and the existing Samuel Sports College there. So this is an aerial view, um, just to show a little bit more of the screening that, you could, that exists on site. So you can just about see there some of the trees uh, and they actually run along the south boundary, the eastern boundary and along the northern boundary as well. And then you can see just here on the west, um, adjacent to the site will be the synthetic uh, turf pitch that's already um, on site. OK, so this is the proposed site plan um, for the development. So you can see here the main two storey building that's proposed in the northeastern corner of the site. Um, you can also see a multi use games area here to the southwest of the site. Um, and this here, this hashed line, is the foul sewer easement zone, um, which can't be built on, which is why um, the school has been located within this northeastern corner here, and also part of the reason that it was a two story design. Um, you can also see just in this northwestern corner, uh, northeastern corner, sorry, here, um, some of the proposed additional planting for the site, because this is the sparsest area of, of existing screening. Um, and you can also see the proposed one-way drop-off loop system here. Um, <laughs> into the school. Okay, so just the elevations of the site here. This top one is the northern elevation, so this is what the nearest residences will see from the front. Uh, then we've got the southern elevation here, and then at the bottom we've got the eastern and western elevations of the school. And um, it's a here we've got the materials, so this will help sort of put the elevations into context slightly more. Um, these pictures are actually from Austin Academy, um, which was one we approved at committee, uh, I believe, last year, um, and it's located in Basingstoke. The proposed materials of this school for Samuel Cody are very, very similar in nature, so you can see um, some of the colours of the, of the brickwork and the materials there. So just some sections of the site to give a bit of context for the surrounding area. So this top view is from east to west. So you can see the existing screening here on the <coughs> east side is actually taller than the proposed building will be. Um, the site is relatively flat in nature. And then at the bottom here, we've got a, a view from uh, north to south. So this little building here is the existing housing nearest resident residences to the north. Uh, and then this is the proposed two storey school building here. And then this is the height of the proposed planting. 
for some views of the existing site for you. This photo at the top here is looking towards the northern residences. So these are the northern residences and then this here is the northeastern corner where the, the vegetation is sparsest. And then you've got down at the bottom here, the southern view. Uh, at the top here, we're now looking west. So you can just about see in the distance there some buildings and that's the existing Samuel Sports College. Um, and you can also see the, the flood lighting on the synthetic uh, sports pitch there. And at the bottom here, you've got a view of the southeast entrance to the school. So this road here is uh, Valentine Road. And this is the entrance into the school and the car park just here. So this perspective view just gives you a little bit more context uh, in relation to the, the houses to the north and some of the existing screening on, uh, on the edges of the site here. Um, and just for context, the, so these houses in this northwest corner, uh, the distance between them and sort of this existing vegetation here is about 10 metres. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, 10 metres. And then the houses here are slightly further away because of this sort of courtyard. So this is about 25 metres to the boundary here. Um, you can also see the, the two storey school there and again, the one way loop system. So this is hopefully a little video um, which will take you from the northeastern, northwestern corner of the site across, apologies if it's a little movie, so across the northern edge of the site running down to the eastern edge with all the existing vegetation and then as it continues round we see the south edge of the site and then it will end uh, with a view to the west looking across the synthetic <coughs> turf pitch okay okay so in terms of consultations and representations um, that were made in relation to the uh, development, there was an objection from Sport England, um, but in this case, because the playing field land uh, has not actually been used for 10 years, they are not a statutory consultee in this instance. And there are obviously uh, further details on this uh, within the committee report that we were provided with. Um, there were no objections from other statutory consultees subject to conditions which have been included in Appendix A uh, and within the update report that you should all have received as well. Um, Councillor Chad was informed of the uh, development and we received three public representations in relation to the proposal, uh, which are addressed uh, within the commentary in the report. So some key issues raised by the proposal are the, pri the principle of the development, highway safety and amenity, flood risk and drainage, loss of playing field land, contaminated land, design, scale and massing of the proposed school building, sustainability and visual impact and landscape. Uh, so in relation to highway safety and amenity, um, the Highway Authority raised no concerns uh, in terms of the, the impact from this development and due to the nature of uh, the needs of the children, um, a lot of the transport associated with the school will be things like minibuses uh, and taxis. Mm -hmm. um, flood risk and drainage um, is addressed within the report um, and there's also a condition related to the need for a surface water drainage uh, scheme to be submitted. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, the development will lead to a loss of playing field land, um, but this is obviously uh, resolved within the report as, as being considered acceptable in this instance. Contaminated land, again, there are conditions relating to this uh, included in Appendix A. Um, and in relation to sustainability, uh, you will see that the uh, design includes uh, photovoltaic panels on the flat roof of the building, uh, amongst other uh, sustainability aspects, such as a ventilation system. Um, so our rec recommendation as officers is that planning permission be granted subject to the conditions listed in Appendix A and those contained within the update report. And I will now also hopefully just show you a quick uh, uh, aerial video of the site um, just so that you can see the site in the best possible context. So hopefully that's playing for you all your end. So this is the existing uh, synthetic turf pitch and some of the parking. 
So the drone is now heading towards the north. And you can just see the empty nature of the, of the site as it stands at the moment and some of the uh, screening. that's the end of my presentation. Over to you, Chairman. Thank you, Amy. Uh, that's very clear. Uh, and of course, we had uh, a virtual site visit, which we pretty well had again this morning, uh, last week. So in essence, application for a 92 place new school academy for pupils with SEN. And I think the crunch paragraph in your report is paragraph 75 which uh, identifies the strong need uh, for schools, academies uh, with children uh, with, with special needs, uh, which and the number has doubled within the last five years. There have been no objections to the application. And in fact, I think there are three letters of support of it. Um, I'll now call upon uh, the deputy is uh, Dan Keeler, who is going to present his uh, deputation on behalf of Hampshire County Council. Thank you, Dan. You've got 10 minutes. Uh, thank you and good morning, Chairman and members. Uh, thank morning. You for, morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to outline the reasons behind our design decisions. The Samuel Cody Specialist Sports College currently provides education for up to 205 uh, children <coughs> for ASD moderate learning difficulties aged 4 to 16 and covers the principal catchment area of Rushmore and Hart, but also takes pupils from other boroughs uh, even out of out across the bound, boundary of the county as well. The site occupies the former Oak Farm Secondary School site and has significant available external space to accommodate the proposed new facility. This proposal to expand the current Samuel Cody College in Farnborough is to meet continuing demand for social, emotional and mental health provision across the county and to reduce the significant revenue costs linked to both independent and out of county placements by providing the places close to the area of need. The proposed SEMH campus has been designed to meet Building Bulletin 104 guidance and will offer 90 places for primary and secondary age pupils aged 10 to 16 years. This will be an expansion of Samuel Cody and broaden its designation and offer to include SEMH needs. Pupils attending the main campus and the new SEMH campus would not be mixed due to their relative vulnerabilities. Proposed design allows consideration for some internal, internal adaptation and future expansion. You may notice that the building design and layout is very similar to the new Austin Academy in Chinham Park, Basingstoke, approved by this committee in July 2019 and completed last summer. The design for this project has been based on this successful model and optimised to meet the complex needs of the current and future SEMH cohort at Samuel Cody. This approach has been adopted to facilitate fast track delivery to meet the opening date of September 2022. You have already heard the consultations that have been made, but extensive, extensive consultations were held with the uh, school, the end user, children's services specialist advisors, including the planning authority and the wider design team. Public consultations were held online due to the COVID restrictions between November and December and included Oak Farm Preschool, the Leisure Club, the U3A and many other community users of the school site. Extensive consultations were also held with Sport England and the FA to demonstrate effective use and enhancement of the vacant site and also with Rushmore Borough Council Planning and Environmental Health to ensure the site and the ground conditions are appropriate. HCC Children's Services have informed the local member and Executive Member of Education and Skills, Councillor Ros Chad, on the timing of the delivery programme. An extensive site search by Property Services Estates team identified Samuel Cody and Farnborough as the most appropriate site for SEN, SEMH co-location and expansion. The site identified that you've seen is 
is 2.4 <coughs> hectares of surplus land and lies to the east of the existing school campus and STP. The two storey building has been carefully placed in the northeast corner of the site to maximise access and use of external areas. The compact footprint also responds to the existing significant foul sewer easement zone running diagonally across the site. The campus layout makes best use of the site, balancing the needs of pupils, staff and visitors, whilst retaining and maximising the natural features of the site, such as the mature tree belt to the north, east and south boundaries, and the existing open playing fields to the south. The double height multi-use hall addresses the public realm and provides good community access from the west and a welcoming entrance to the school. Likewise, the new mugger is located to the west and adjacent existing sports facilities for easy access and use by the main school, campus and community. The fenestration to the front and rear of the teaching wing is articulated by a horizontal band of windows to provide ample daylight and ventilation. Grease lay shading to the south controls solar gain and glare to the interior spaces. As you have seen, a simple palette of attractive materials, including traditional brickwork and aluminium glazing system, have been carefully detailed to be durable and easily maintained. In terms of highway considerations, the school transport plan and assessment indicate that the new access road can accommodate vehicles without compromising the network capacity and public safety. The existing school campus is served by two site entrances, two site entrances, but currently only uses the main Ballantyne Road entrance to the north. To improve traffic movement and circulation, the existing Chaucer Road entrance to the west will be reopened for peak period use. All vehicles serving the new SEMH building will approach the site from the west via the main school campus and new access road to the drop-off pickup loop and parking areas. Due to the large catchment areas, most pupils will arrive and depart by taxi, minibus and cars. This is also the case for most of the teaching and specialist staff. However, additional parking for staff, pupils <coughs> of cycles are provided in accordance with Hampshire parking and cycle storage standards. The project will also include a new footpath link between the existing school campus and the new SEMH school. In terms of landscape, you will have seen that there is a mature tree belt to the north east and south boundaries, which is a significant natural feature of the site, and this will be retained and enhanced to provide enclosure and screening. Some tree works will be required to improve site security and passive supervision to the eastern and southern boundaries. New trees and hedges are proposed to compensate for loss of any vegetation and trees. Outdoor learning and social activities take place within a secure zone to the south of the boundary of the building. This consists of a hard landscape social spaces close to the building, a multi-use games area, a trim trail, playing field and some more casual spaces within the tree belt. A separate pat quiet patio area is provided for students with more extreme needs who are unable to mix with others. The use and type of fencing has been carefully considered to suit the needs of the pupils and avoid highly segregated spaces. Pupils and staff will be able to use the external spaces with a view to encourage outdoor activities. The landscape scheme provides valuable opportunities through a variety of different settings to encourage outdoor learning activities, play and sport. In terms of the environmental strategy, it is, this is to create a school that is comfortable to use and cost effective to run. This includes providing a well insulated building with a good standard of air tightness, installing high efficiency boilers and controls, ventilating the teaching spaces by means of hybrid ventilation to provide good indoor air quality and comfort conditions, maximizing natural light to all spaces, providing a large PV array to offset electrical electricity consumption, and also achieving BRIAM certification to very good standard and excellent for water conservation. In conclusion, these proposals provide much needed facilities for SEMH pupils within the catchment area. They provide a robust and flexible learning environment to suit the sensitive and vulnerable nature of the SEMH pupils. The proposals have considered and incorporated views of consultees, the end user and school governing body and local stakeholders. The scheme provides high quality internal and external spaces 
that create a familiar, secure and safe learning environment for pupils and staff. And it is well located as part of the wider school campus and independent with its own identity. The proposals create good public value through careful placement and considered design, expand community access to sports facilities and have been designed to be efficient in terms of operation and the maintenance costs. The scheme also offers best value and achieves an appropriate quality learning environment as demonstrated by the recently completed Austin Academy project. The lean and compact school building maximises the use of site. The natural tree belt enclosure provides a safe, secure and stimulating learning environment, which will benefit many SEMH pupils now and for future generations to come. Thank you. Daniel, thank you for your clear and comprehensive report. Um, members, do you have any questions of the deputy? Clearly not. That's, uh, uh, that hand's gone up. I can't see who it is. Councillor Hughes, Chairman. Oh, Councillor Hughes, Gary. Thank you, Chairman. I have a question relating to flood and water management, and I'm not sure whether it's best answered by Daniel or by the officers when we get the opportunity to ask the questions of the officers. Well, try, try with Daniel and see if you're happy. I'll do my best, Councillor. Thank you. Um, I, I've read the report and I'm, I'm drawn to flood and water management and uh, the conditions. I noticed you're intending to use um, tanks and uh, pipes to move it to the, uh, the uh, water uh, the sewage system. I have two questions. Firstly, how many schools in our county rely on internal suds to address flood management? And secondly, will the water be drained away to a surface water drainage system and not and not a combined sewer? Is that correct? Uh, yes, Councillor. Um, it, it's, it's quite common for us to put attenuation tanks within the site to deal with um, on-site, well, particularly one in the 100 year flooding incidents. So we've also demonstrated to both the um, uh, Environment Agency and the flood management team um, that how this would work within the site boundaries, um, uh, including exceedance for a one in a hundred year flood event. And yes, it does connect to a stormwater drain. Uh, with, there's a stormwater drain connection to the north of the site, but also one to the south of the site that is available. Thank you very much. OK. Um, are there, so anyone else have any questions of uh, the Deputy Dan, uh, Dan Keeler? If not, then members, do you have any questions of uh, Amy? Uh, clearly it would appear we don't. Um, James, do you have anything that you wish to add to what has been said so far? Um, no, nothing from me. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Does anyone wish to debate what seems to be a pretty straightforward application? There's a hand gone up. And it's uh, Lance. That's the control. Yeah, Lance. Yeah, the, the thing that troubled me about this application was the loss of sports playing fields. Yeah. Um, and although not a statutory consultation, um, Sport England did put in an objection. On balance, having seen it's not been used for 10 years and also we have a new multi-use games um, facility um, and section 101 in the officer's report says the playing field loss is surplus to requirement. On balance, I, I would favour this uh, to deliver the services for special education needs, even if there is a, a risk of loss of uh, sports facilities. Thank you, Lance. Another hand. Uh, Councillor Cooper, Ross uh, Cooper. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, I absolutely wholeheartedly welcome this development uh, as uh, a neighbouring councillor to this area, uh, and I'm quite familiar with the area. Um, the, um, uh, Councillor Contral, let me tell you now that that field definitely has not been used for the last 10 years. So it's putting uh, a piece of land to excellent use. Uh, it's just a shame it's only 90 places because the need throughout the county uh, seems to be a lot, lot higher. So I wholeheartedly support this development and welcome it. Thank you. 
Um, thank you, Rod. Uh, Councillor Frankham, Jane. Um, thank you. Uh, this is very similar to um, the Austin Academy, which is in my uh, division. I, I read through very, very carefully uh, and uh, like the other councillor, the only objection seemed to be from uh, Sports, Sports England. And really, as the, the field hasn't been used for 10 years, I, I really feel this is a, a wonderful, um, a wonderful school, wonderful academy. And I very happily uh, second the, the recommendation for this. I, I so needed. Thank you, Jane. Um, is there anyone else who wish to speak on this item? I've got Councillor Mark Cooper, Chairman. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, Mark, Councillor Cooper again. Just very briefly, Chairman. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to support the application. It is, it is much needed. Um, the only qu query I had was that um, I couldn't find a mud condition, but I did find it on my second read through under condition three. So uh, right. that's, bearing in mind they drone photographs of the site, which is very, very wet and, and muddy, uh, much needed. So we're very, very, very keen and happy to support. OK, so, well, it looks as if we are all in support of this application. So I'll, w without further ado, I'll go over to the recommendation. And the recommendation is that planning permission be granted uh, subject to conditions listed in Appendix A and the updated report. Um, can I ask, can you all, can, do you all agree uh, that it's uh, approved? Agreed. Anyone Agreed. against it? Agreed. 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 That's Agreed. Great. Thanks for that. So, um, that's all agreed. So we now move on swiftly to item number seven, which is a review of the Hampshire Mineral and Waste Plan. Um, you'll remember this came up at Cabinet in February um, as to the procedure, and it was then confirmed at full council last month. And this is an updated report, an information item uh, which Melissa will be presenting to us, uh, giving us further details and gives you the opportunity to raise any questions that you may have on the procedure as we move forward to a new plan, which should be available and confirmed, I think, hopefully by the autumn of 2023. Um, Melissa, over to you to present it. Thank you, Councillor Latham. I'm going to share my screen now. OK, can you see the presentation on your screen? We can. Excellent. Thank you very much. So as Councillor Lentham pointed out, I'm here today to talk to you about the um, 2020 review that's been undertaken recently. As you may recall, I came to speak to your committee a couple of years ago following completion of a review undertaken in 2018. This was following a five year period from adoption of the current 2013 plan. And at the time in 2018, we undertook a review of the plan and that identified that on the whole, the plan was still working effectively. However, there are a couple of issues that were identified and we agreed that we needed to keep an, an eye on these issues as the time progressed. So there was a commitment to undertake a further review in 2020, but also we um, undertook a workshop in 2019 to discuss some of these issues. So the 2020 review that was completed by my team last year followed in a similar vein to the 2018 review in which its methodology looked at the monitoring data that we'd been collecting over the five or then seven year period 
to see whether this was identifying any issues or whether any triggers have been um, highlighted where we were kind of suggesting a review might be required. If this was the case, we explored the circumstances in more detail to see whether the policy required an update or whether there were certain circumstances which had triggered this um, incident and an issue with the policy. So the same methodology that was applied in 2018 was applied to the 2020 review. But in addition, since we undertook the 18 review, there's been some guidance provided by the planning um, advisory service on undertaking reviews of plans. And following that guidance, it suggested that we also ought to look at whether the vision and the plan objectives were still effective, but also it, held, it provided a useful guidance for checking whether the contents of the plan was in compliance with the national planning policy framework. But because of the nature of our plan being a minerals and waste plan, we also confirmed compliance with the national planning policy for waste, which if you recall was um, published in 2014, so after the plan was adopted. In addition, we looked at all the policy drivers that have come out from government um, more recently. Um, since we did the 18 um, review, obviously there's, still, there's been further documents that have been released, including the waste and resources strategy. But also the 2020 review gives a summary of the workshop that was undertaken in September 2019 and then sets out our conclusions. So the conclusions made in the 2020 review were that very similar to the 2018 review in that the development management policies were generally working quite well and were effective. However, from undertaking the compliance check with the MPPF, there's obviously been some most, more recent changes. And whilst the general principles of, of the policies were still effective and followed the requirements of the MPPF, there's some subtle changes that need, needed to be made to the policy, sort of kind of a refresh on some of the terminology and approaches. In addition, you'll be aware that we have a climate change policy, but as time has moved on, we feel that that policy could be strengthened further. In relation to the minerals policies, some of the issues we were identifying back in 2018 in terms of provision and suggestions that maybe we were struggling with that provision have been further embedded in a couple of years since um, that initial review was undertaken. So we now know that we really do need to go back to some of our provision requirements. We're still struggling to meet our local land bank and, and therefore this might suggest that our local provision rate, particularly for sand and gravel that was made back in when the adopted plan in 2013, is maybe not at the set at the right level. In addition, we're recognising that there's capacity issues with regards to recycled and secondary aggregate, which needs further investigation on what's going on in terms of markets and um, provision of capacity, but also the material that's coming in on these sites. In addition, we are recognising that there's capacity issues on our wharves and depots, and this also needs further investigation. To support some of this work, we also would like to see what further site options are out there. We know that we've got existing allocations in place. Some of those have come in since we've adopted the plan. Some are on the horizon and for our understanding. But however, we might want to explore whether there are any other options available to us. Likewise, with the waste policies, at the time when we did the 2018 review, our provision rates that we'd set um, within the plan in terms of capacity were generally being met um, from the forecast that we had applied at the time. However, more recently, there's been quite a lot of work being done at a regional level to look at methodologies for forecasting waste. And this is so all mineral planning, um, minerals and waste planning authorities in the southeast would be applying similar methodologies. So we would like to apply these new methodologies to see if there's any major changes in our forecasting and what provision we might need to make for the future. As we highlighted in 2018, whilst our provision rates are being met to our forecasted rate, what we're finding is that we've got a high proportion of recovery instead of recycling. And as you'll recall in the waste hierarchy, we'd ideally be looking to recycle more with then recovery and then disposal. So what we'd like to do is whether there can be any changes to our policy um, proposals to try and encourage the recycling levels to increase. We're also aware there's obviously been a lot more discussion and um, regarding energy provision, um, and that's linked obviously quite cl uh, closely to the climate change. So what we'd like to do is an update of our policy approach um, currently in place. 
Again, to support this, um, you'll be aware that in the 2013 adopted plan, the only allocated sites at the time were landfill, because at, at that point in time, we had quite a good strong network of uh, waste sites. However, if we're going to be looking at what our proposals and forecastings are for those sites, and we, we also want to take check on what sites have been coming forward during that time, we may want to see whether there are any uh, waste site options out there that we may want to support as allocations within a plan update. As I mentioned, we've also looked at the vision and plan objectives. And I think at the time when we wrote the 2013 adopted plan, the vision that we put in place there was aimed to be kind of flexible and quite generic. However, our feeling now is that it, it is too generic and doesn't really reflect um, the needs of Hampshire. And I think particularly where there's been the recent climate change emergencies, that's climate change isn't mentioned in the vision, um, but also there's been a huge amount of work that's been undertaken as part of the 2050 Commission and how we want to view Brilliant. Hampshire in the future. And so we really feel that we need to have another look at the revision, um, a revision of the, the vision, sorry, to kind of see if we can incorporate some of these recommendations and strengthen our, uh, our, our need to address climate change. And that will then trickle through into the plan objectives. So our overall con conclusion from the 2020 review, there's whilst, whilst much of the plan is still working effectively, there are parts of those that need to be refreshed and updated. So it was a partial update that was being proposed as part of the review. Therefore, to support a partial update, a development scheme has also been prepared, which you will have seen in support of this. The development scheme sets out our timetable for taking this uh, project forward. Initially, the work is proposed to start this month in March, and that will run through to September of this year. During that time period, we would like to kick off the work with a call for sites. That is an invitation to operators, landowners and agents to submit site nominations to us for consideration. Alongside that, we will also be preparing all our background documents, which I'll go through with you shortly. Therefore, the first public consultation that will take place is scheduled for autumn sort of winter time this year. And what we're proposing is to go up for consultation on a draft plan version. So it will set out all of the proposed changes we're trying to make to the, um, to the current plan. It's then proposed that in early 2022, we will review the draft plan in, in, in response to the responses we received to that consultation with a view that we would then prepare to submit the plan to the Secretary of State in winter 2022. At that point, our timetable is really in the hands of the planning inspectorate, but we anticipate that we would hopefully be in a position to be uh, adopting the partially updated plan in the autumn of 2023. You'll note that it's quite a tight timetable that's partly to reflect that it is a partial update of the plan, not a full um, comprehensive overview, but also you'll recall that there's been some recent planning consultations on the planning system coming out from government. And as part of that, they're proposing that the timetables of plan reviews are, are shortened and kept more focused. So that is why this timetable is looking to try and reflect those proposed changes. So as part of the partial plan update program, There'll be a number of documents that will need to be prepared over the course of this summer. Two of the key minerals and waste documents will be the document setting out our, our current um, information on sales and data and forecasts, but also the sites that have been put forward to us. There'll be all the statutory assessments that are required, which are the sustainability appraisal, habitat regulations assessment and flood risk assessment and equalities. Then we'll also be making use of all our colleagues within the department to undertake the traffic and transport assessments, landscape and visual impact, heritage and equality, ecology assessments. But also to support some of the issues that have been particularly identified through the 2020 review, as I mentioned, we'll be doing an investigation of what's going on in terms of our walls and depots provision, what's going on currently in the sites and what the operators feel the future looks like, what issues they're aware of in terms of capacity. We will undertake a climate change topic paper to get a better understanding of how we look at minerals and waste issues. Again, with aggregate recycling, that's also going to consider secondary um, materials as well. But also, as I mentioned, we've had quite a few ad hoc discussions with operators over the years in terms of issues over provision of materials, capacity on their site and markets. 
So what we want to do is prepare a topic paper to explore those issues in a bit more detail to see whether the plan can do more. But equally, we also need to um, look at kind of our restoration proposals to make sure they align with what's coming out of documents such as the 25 Environment Youth Plan. So in summary, as I mentioned, we've obviously signed off the well, in, within Hampshire, the 2020 review and the development scheme. But obviously we work with partners at the cities and the national parks. As already mentioned, um, Hampshire signed off the 2020 review and the development scheme at full council on the 25th of February. Our partners are now taking the documents through their decision making processes and these were, should be completed by the 25th of March. At that point, the development plan comes into effect. So we're then starting our process and we're following that timetable. As I mentioned, we will also be undertaking a call for sites that will be starting in April. And we're looking to hold that for a minimum period of about eight weeks. We will be communicating to operators that we will be having this one window opportunity for them to submit the sites to us for us to consider. Because if, if they start submitting sites later on in the process, that quite often is what leads to delays in delivering the timescales. And also, as also mentioned, our first public engagement will take place around October of this year. That concludes my presentation. Thank you, Melissa. Um, the current plan, 2013, is the Bible that we all work to at the moment. And is the one which we will continue to work to until the new one. Now, looking forward, none of us councillors here today know whether we will be councillors after May or indeed whether we will even be on the regulatory committee after May. Um, does Is it proposed that in the interim between now and publication of the final plan, can it be confirmed that the committee will be regularly updated on progress with regard to the new plan, so that when the new plan does come into force, we will at least know what is happening and perhaps even take into account proposals whilst the new plan is being formulated? I'd be very happy to keep you regularly informed in the process as we move forward, Councillor Latham. I mean, I think we, we ought to have six monthly re reports or, or the new committee should have six monthly reports to let them know how the new plan is being formulated. Would you agree with that, Mark? You're nodding. <laughs> I, I was going to ask that same question, Chairman. You've already dealt with it, so I fully okay. agree. Yeah. Any other questions to Melissa? Uh, Chairman, Chairman yeah. this, the, uh, the, um, this report came in after seven years, uh, which was 2020, and then it was uh, going to be approved in 2021, implement, implementation in 2023. Would it possible to add that um, this report or should be looked at it every five years? If there is a because there is a legislation maybe in place by the government and we should be reviewing every five years instead this, of seven, eight years, ten years. It is uh, legislation says it should be looked at uh, every five years already, and we did look at it in 2018, which was five years after the 2013 plan came into effect, and decided then it didn't need any substantial change. We then in 2018 decided that we would uh, look at it again in 2020, which is why we're looking at it now. But yes, it's, it, there's a statutory requirement, as far as I'm aware, that they are looked at every five years. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Quantrill. Uh, thank you. A question for Ms Spriggs. Um, very comprehensive and robust way of internally producing our plan. I wonder whether we take any notice of best practice in other councils uh, and whether there's a peer review amongst your um, uh, compatriots uh, in other councils, which we could rely on to know what good looks like. I think that's a very interesting point, Councillor Control. And actually, we have got a very good working relationship with the other minerals and waste planning authorities, particularly in the southeast, but also with part of a, um, a national forum as well where much of these issues are discussed quite regularly. 
And actually, what I was mentioning previously about these um, collective waste methodologies is work that we are trying to do across um, our region and trying to have similar approaches. Actually, when we prepared the 2018 review, very few um, reviews of that nature had been undertaken at that time, and many other authorities came to us to discuss how we had undertaken our review at that time. So there is lots of shared learning between other minerals and waste planning authorities, and that's something that will continue and something we will we'll be taking forward, yeah. Okay, Lance. Um, next is Chris, Councillor Carter. Um, Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, ju just very briefly to, to add to the comments that you've um, just made yourself, um, I, I, I think we can anticipate that there will probably be substantial change to the regulatory committee um, following the elections with, with probably a, a lot of new members um, uh, new to, to, to regulatory. So um, the, 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 there will obviously be training, and I, and I would just suggest that um, a, a resume of, of, of what we've heard um, this morning, uh, uh, and I obviously welcome that, and uh, I think that should be included in the training, which will be not too soon after the elections, I, I would anticipate. I think we all, I think the officers already intend to do that, Chris. Um, it, it's well on the agenda. Um, and, and, and hopefully before the first meeting of, of the regulatory committee in June. Um, Councillor Hughes. Can't hear Councillor Hughes. So Councillor Gibson and uh, Andrew. Yeah, I just um, I say a few words before Councillor Hughes comes back on. <coughs> um, I won't be around next time because I'm not standing in May, but I'd just like to make a couple of observations. <clears throat> um, first of all, is we oversee a massive end-to-end -end business and the mineral waste um, uh, strategy and plan is obviously very, very important. I, I have two questions. First of all, should we be more aggressive? Like when um, uh, something comes forward like Three Maids Hill, I never quite know whether it's part of the plan, whether we've got um, uh, a deficit of that particular um, type of centre. And it would be quite interesting, I think, for um, future regulatory committee members to actually have a grasp on uh, when there is an application, how does it fit in the plan? Um, like we saw with the incinerator on the A303, Hampshire, um, were a bit, little bit ambivalent. They um, they they said it wasn't included in the uh, plan, but we obviously had some demand for incinerators. Um, so that's my first point. The second point is that uh, I've got a particular situation which I, I've risen, uh, raised already today, but before the meeting. Um, we've got a situation where one of the sites in my area, which is the Fortis A303 um, site, is actually uh, stockpiling. I mean, everybody's stockpiling, it's COVID. So um, they're stockpiling IBAA. Um, but they're actually, their big markets are in Kent. So they're, they're moving loads of this IBAA over to Kent. And the reason they're doing that and the stockpile's going up is because for some reason, despite getting um, a lot of... Um, plaudits from highways um, senior management um, as to the quality of their IBA. <clears throat> highways aren't adopting it. So we have this disconnect where we have the strategy, we get um, the um, body reprocessed um, into IBAA and then suddenly um, highways apparently are taking materials from Somerset rather because there seems to be some internal discussion. I just like to see the whole mineral and waste program much more joined up in terms of, um, rather than us being quite gentlemanly and saying, you know, um, um, you know, overseeing a, a sort of um, um, something that's sort of moving, rather be more restri uh, restri uh, restrictive and say, look, if we are actually supporting the use of IBAA 
the production of IBA, then make sure it's the right quality and use it in Hampshire rather than importing from Somerset. That's my point. Mel, does that make sense to you? Mel, are you going to do it? Yes, no, I'm happy to respond to that. Thank you very much, Councillor Gibson. I think you've picked up a couple of key points, actually, that um, one most notably that we've identified that what we also need alongside the plan, so not within the plan, but sits alongside the plan, is working with our waste management colleagues on a waste management strategy, because I think that's what we need to support this in terms of what our needs are going forward. Um, in addition, in terms of the um, IBAA issue, it's an interesting one. I think this is one part of this investigation that we need to do in terms of aggregate recycling and secondary, in terms of understanding more in terms of not only the capacity, but the markets and the materials that are being moved around as well, because we're having similar discussions with a number of operators. Um, and interestingly, policy 30 in our plan at the moment, it supports the use of, encourages the use of um, inert materials, so CD and E waste, construction, demolition and excavation. It talks about secondary aggregates, but it doesn't have the equal um, encouragement of use as it does with the um, recycled aggregate. So I think this is all something we can look at as we kind of pull together and start investigating that issue as part of the plan. So we are aware of some of the discussions that are going on with highways and that will be part of that investigation as we go forward. So it's definitely on our radar. And again, hopefully to support your um, initial discussion, yes, a waste strategy is being um, discussed and will be pulled together alongside of the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan. The two documents will work together. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, thank you for your question. Um, I think it's very difficult at this stage for officers to say how the plan will end up regional issues, which I think what is what you're talking about. Um, no, I don't think it's a regional issue. I think it's I'm talking about my site, but I, I, I think it's I know you are, but I, I think, think it's across Hampshire issue of of uh, is IBA I, IBAA being re uh, being used or are they going for the uh, original raw materials? It's um, it's not just a local issue. I, I think that one of the things that the officers will have to bear in mind, and I know they are, is that the at times the existing there are ambiguities within the existing plan, and whatever the new plan is, they must make it. It will it will be our bible for the future, and the wording of the plan must be absolutely clear so that there can be no um, misunderstanding between different paragraphs within the plan. As I think we, we perhaps saw with the new maids issue in January between uh, paragraph five regarding the countryside and paragraph 29 when they tended to clash. And that I think is the type of issue which uh, the officers will have to look at very carefully. So the new plan is a Bible which is absolutely clear. Um, Councillor Hughes. Um, thank you. You're muted. Sorry, Chairman, I couldn't speak earlier on, so thank you for coming back to me. Um, Melissa, two questions if I may. Firstly, uh, in the report, you talk about the, uh, the shortfall of soft sand. Um, is there, do you believe there is the, the potential within Hampshire to meet that supply? That's my first question. Or will we still have to have those uh, support from neighbouring authorities? I can respond to that first question. We do have an issue with soft sand supply. As you'll be aware, we've got the remaining allocation at Purple Haze, which is a significant supply of about 3 million tonnes. However, geographically, that's in one part of Hampshire, which is most likely to feed the Dorset market. And then in more recent times, um, historically, we've considered the sites at um, Kingsley and Frithend as being soft sand sites. As, we, as we're more aware now, that their class of material is silica, and the extension to Kingsley has been on the whole um, silica sand rather than soft sand supplies. So we do potentially still have an issue going forward. I think we will have to wait and see what our response is from the call to sites to see whether there are any viable options to us in terms of supply. 
if we cannot find suitable provision within Hampshire, we may then need to have discussions with our neighbouring authorities that have that um, supply. But equally, we're fully aware that there's already issues of supply elsewhere within the region. So as we mentioned um, previously, in terms of regional discussions, this is something that is talked a lot about at the uh, South East uh, Agri Working Party. There's a, there's a number of authorities that some have soft sand and some don't, and it's trying to understand those relationships and making sure they're sufficient almost at a regional level. So we will have to see, we will do more work on um, our supply issues. We'll have to see what comes out of our site's um, work. But equally, I think we're going to be having uh, these discussions at a regional level in terms of supply. So it's a, we'll, we'll be looking into this one and hopefully in six months time, we'll be able to give you more of an update on that one. Thank you. And so my second question is, um, during my uh, time on this committee, which has been incredibly educational, I found out things about Hampshire I never knew existed previously. Uh, mineral science, so quarries, waste management science, etc. I just wonder, as part of the review, will there be any audit of the approved sites to determine if they've been brought forward as indicated in their original applications? Well, that's an interesting one. We're, that's more to do with the monitoring enforcement of the sites once they've got permission. Um, so what we will be doing is looking at what sites have come forward and in what nature and how those operate. In terms of how that permission has been implemented doesn't necessarily sit with the plan. So that might be more one to sit with um, the monitoring enforcement team to see whether they've got any um, proposals to look back on some of those proposals to see how they've met with their original permissions. Well, no, sorry, if I may, supplementary if I may, please, Chair. The, the point I'm making is we, we went to sites and we approved uh, quarries, etc., and excavation on the basis of an application that said, if this came forward, this would generate X amount of uh, contribution to a Hampshire waste and mineral plan. My question is, have we ever gone back to check whether they, what they said they would provide has been provided? Sorry, Councillor Hughes, I understand your question. We monitor um, all of our aggregate sites on an annual basis in terms of how much they're producing, how much they have in terms of reserves. So that actually information is gathered every year and applied and recorded in our local aggregate assessment. And that's the information that we'll be using to help inform um, what our potential forecast will be going forward in the future. It's not only past sales that we'll be looking at. We need to look at the uh, current economic situations, construction and um, uh, forecasts and development proposals. So all of that will build part of that picture to help us um, yeah, forecast what our needs will be going to do gather that information on an annual basis. Minister, very helpful. Thank you. Um, Councillor Philpott. Stephen. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Sorry, I was just unmuting there. Um, thank you. Thank you for the report, uh, Melissa. I've got a, uh, I've got a huge amount of sympathy for, uh, for planning policy officers across the country at the moment, trying to deal with all of the changes. And there are a huge number of potential changes coming down the line in terms of planning policy. Uh, we've had the, uh, the white paper in two parts last August, and we had another consultation document in December relating to, uh, to permitted development rights. There is actually uh, currently another um, uh, uh, consultation document that the government have launched on the national planning policy framework itself. Uh, and uh, uh, and I, I imagine that, uh, that we as, a, as an authority, although mercifully these, uh, many of these changes or the vast majority of these changes impact more on district authority planning than they do on the, us as a county, but I imagine we as an authority do make representations where appropriate uh, on these consultations as and when they come up. Um, I'm not sure that I always see uh, what the county uh, 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 responses are to that. So uh, just a, an observation and a request potentially that we perhaps uh, uh, not on a, uh, an officer report to board, obviously, but just as say members information bulletins and the like, that we're informed and kept up to date with what our officers are responding to in terms of all these consultations from the communities and local government. Now, that, that said, I mean, the, the latest consultation on the National Planning Policy Framework uh, proposes very few changes uh, in, uh, in part 17 of the NPPF, which is the sustainable use of minerals. But I was struck actually by an interesting one. I wonder if you might be able to help me out on this. Is, um, 
there's a proposal there to introduce uh, a mineral consultation thing called mineral consultation areas. And I have tried to find out what a mineral consultation area is. Um, they already have in their uh, mineral safeguarding areas, which is all part of the NPPF as it currently stands, but they, they want to build these consultation areas. Now, as we go forward through our, our Reg 18 and Reg 19, Melissa, and to our, to our uh, Reg 18, Reg 19 consultation with the public, uh, it would be helpful to know really what the views of the county are on some of these, these changes and whether they're, whether they're big changes or small ones, because I have no idea whether this is a minor tweak or whether this is really something I should really want to need to know about. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I don't think, Melissa, can, can, can you respond to that or not? I can actually respond to that. Um, and actually, it's a, it's a funny one, this one, because actually it's more the MPPF almost catching up with how minerals and waste planning authorities tend to apply uh, mineral consultation areas already. And that's, that change in the MPPF has almost been driven um, partially by operators and for mineral planning authorities to say that actually you need to make sure that mineral consultation areas are applied not only to resources but infrastructure as well because you have mineral safeguarding areas um predominantly for the resource which show which protects the resource from sterilization and then you've got need to safeguard the infrastructure as well so your quarries and your processing plants and what they were finding that we've got mineral consultation areas i think applied to the infrastructure or, or the resources and apologies i can't remember which which way around it was but actually saying so you need to make sure you're applying a mineral consultation area to both which then allows, so if a proposal was to come forward that could potentially either impact on the sterilisation of the material or could have an impact um, next to the infrastructure, so you might want to build some houses next to an existing infrastructure, they want to make sure that mineral planning authorities are consulted on those proposals so we can comment to prevent um, impacts on the operations of the infrastructure or the um, potential sterilisation of the resources. So actually, the proposals that are being suggested by um, made to the MPPF are actually being encouraged um, from the discussion that we're having with mill planning authorities. And I, I understand a response is being drafted as part of the Southeast Agri Working Party in response to that. Um, we actually feel it strengthens um, the MPPF by including those in. They're already in the guidance. It's moving it more to the um, the national plan planning policy framework and it's something we already actually have within our plan currently so we already apply a mineral consultation area to our resource and our infrastructure so we're already we're already there it's the MPPF moving it from guidance to mm -hmm. national policy instead. thank you Melissa um, I think we've now covered all the questions on this particular item and we are purely being asked to note the report Agreed. So, and we are happy with that. Can we then move on to item eight, last item on the agenda, uh, which is the monitoring and enforcement update? And Lisa is going to present this one today. Uh, David is ill. So, over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, members. Um, you've seen the report before you, which Dave's given you a very detailed um, update of the operations and activities of the monitoring enforcement team in the last quarter. Um, I'm just going to give you a few observations, and obviously there's an opportunity to ask questions of myself, um, and I've also asked Tim Felstead, one of the monitoring officers, to come into the meeting, so he's available to ask questions on some of the sites that may come up in discussion. But generally, as a team, the team have seen a quite big increase in the number of complaints and FOI requests um, relating to um, some of our permitted um, sites. And this is a trend that we're seeing um, happening in other local authorities quite a lot at the moment, largely due to um, COVID. And I think it's just something, a trend that's happening at the moment. But you'll see in the report more specifically, we've documented the outcomes of two formal complaints that were made, um, made and received by the council in the last quarter, and that's relating to Bunny Lane and to Calf Lane. I won't go into any particular detail on those two um, 
reports and those two complaints because your, your detail is in your report. But just to give you a heads up that, you know, both complaints were investigated and that they were um, upheld. Um, and just to give you an update as well, that we have received planning applications for two proposals at Bunny Lane. Bunny Lane, what you will um, remember, is the um, application that was refused by the committee in December for the uh, washing plant that um, was already located on site. An application to um, basically address the concerns the committee has been submitted um, alongside a, sub a subsequent application for a variation of hours of working. So that's just an update that you, as a committee, will be seeing um, potentially those items um, later on in the year, potentially if you're still sitting on the committee. In addition, um, the other complaint was received at Calf Lane. Um, an application is in with us um, in relation to that. Um, an application, uh, the application has been submitted to regularise the, um, the issue with noise on site. And we would expect again that that application will come to committee um, after the elections, potentially in June or July. So as I said, I'm happy to answer more, any more detailed questions on those if members do have them. The report also documents um, other activities that have been taking place in relation to chargeable um, visits and the team are out um, actively undertaking those visits in this, in this current quarter as we currently speak. And just finally, as I say, I'm not going to go into any more detail of the report because it is all there, but just finally, just to give you uh, an indication of what's coming on monitoring enforcement. Um, after the elections, we will be bringing to you um, some, um, a couple of documents to get some um, views from the committee on. The first of one will be an update to the liaison panel guidance. We've got an existing guidance document which has been in place for about three to four years. Um, we're currently reviewing that and we'd like to seek some, some views from the committee in relation to that, um, in, in particular with regards to recent experiences um, or with regards to panels. Another update that we're doing is we're updating the enforcement and monitoring plan. Um, this is something that set, essentially sets out the uh, service that we provide and sets out more detail about our enforcement plan. So again, that will be something that members will be able to have sight of and, and feed into. And finally, on top of um, those two documents, an overarching update to the sustainable as uh, the statement of community involvement is being prepared. Um, and that essentially guides community engagement, both on development management, i.e. planning applications, but also on the work for, of the, for the review of the Hampshire Minerals and Waste Plan. So there'll be opportunities, as I say, for members to feed into those. And we would very much welcome um, those uh, views of members when we bring those to towards you. Um, so if there's any questions, I'm more than happy to um, answer them in relation to the update. And as I said, Tim is in the meeting um, to answer some more detailed questions if any were to come up on specific sites. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. Um, clear report setting out the position on Bunny Lane and Car Lane. Uh, any questions, clarifications required by members on anything within that report? Got Councillor Philpot, Chairman. Councillor Philpot, thank you. Stephen. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Just trying to lower my hand there. It's just tricky. Um, Chairman, yes, I, I've got a question relating to paragraphs 33 onwards of the report, and that is that the the concerning the relaxation of planning conditions, and uh, and also the uh, the opportunities that local authorities have been given by government in terms of recommendation to uh, to to uh, use discretion on certain key issues like enforcement and so on. Um, clearly, this is a this is not an easy matter to determine, but uh, at some stage we're going to have to, I imagine, are we not, Lisa, to consider how we're going to um, uh, how how we're going to reinstate. Uh, our position in terms of those conditions. If we're relaxing the conditions at this stage and we're allowing, I don't know, say for example, more vehicle movements or or whatever that might be in terms of whichever the condition happens to be that we're relaxing, at some stage a decision is going to have to be made to go back to those conditions and reimpose them. Now that that's going to be a tricky decision I imagine to make and who's going to make that decision? On what authority do they make that decision? And uh, have you given some consideration to timings? We have actually. Um, that was a really important consideration mm. when we had to consider what we Good could point, do with, with, 
regards to relaxation. So all of the relaxation of conditions that have been agreed under delegated authority all include a time scale, um, essentially when we would you know, expect that agreement to, um, to, to end. So if I use the example of the A303 site that Councillor Gibson has um, uh, mentioned a bit earlier, that had a, relax a number of relaxation agreements in place um, for hours of working and height of stockpiles, all of which had a condition that essentially said by the end of March this year, it would be um, essentially that, that that agreement ends. And as a result, we would then, then expect either a removal of the uh, material, for example, or a, a um, return to the previous condition, or we would request that the applicant um, regularises the development. And that's what we've seen at the A303. There's still an issue with the um, stockpiles on site. So the applicant has now come in with an application to regularise um, the use of that land. So all of these agreements have got those kind of caveats and conditions in place. And essentially, um, it, once we get to the end of that time scale, the conditions are reapplied and then enforcement powers um, um, resume. Having said that, the relaxation of condition agreements are all subject to review. If there were any complaints, we would um, review, uh, review them, potentially remove them, and they do not prohibit us from taking enforcement action either. So if that we were in a situation that we'd agreed a relaxation and the amenity impacts became overriding, we could still take and would still consider to take enforcement action in those circumstances. So very valid points. Um, I'm, on the on the agreements that we've got in place, we have those timescales and those mechanisms to ensure that we know when we're returning back to the previous permissions. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Happy with that. Does anyone else have any questions of Lisa in relation to item number eight, the last, last item on the agenda? If not, then we will note the report and that brings us to the end of the formal part of the meeting. Uh, I'll, leave, I'll ask the webcast be left open um, because it is our last meeting that this committee will uh, meet before the election. Um, I'd like to thank everybody on the committee for all your support. I am aware that there are three members of the existing committee who, who are retiring. Councillor Carter, uh, Councillor uh, Jane Frankham and Councillor Gibson. Thank you in particular to all of you, or all three of you, for your efforts and contributions to this committee over the years. I've known uh, Jane and Chris as members of this committee ever since I've been on it and you have always been most supportive and made valid contributions. Andrew, I know you've only been on for a year but uh, I wish you'd been on longer because you've also been very active in the committee, very supportive and I, sh and, and I will miss your contributions too. As for the rest of us, who I assume are now going to be standing again. All I can say to all of you is thank you for all of your support. Whichever part, party you support, uh, I know you have always been supportive of me. And I would hope that you all go into the election and I hope that we can all see each other on the other side in June, because that would be really nice. And I really mean that. There is, of course, one person who's here today, although I can't see him, um, who is also retiring in April, and that's Chris Murray. Murray, can, can, I can't see you on the screen. Are you there? I think I might be now, Chairman. Um, All yes. right. Hi, Chris. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I have to say that when you told me in, I think it was February, of your intention to retire as the head of strategic planning, there were two emotions. One was amazement and one was real great disappointment. Um, when I look at myself in the mirror in the morning, not a pretty sight, and I then look at the the 
pictures of all the other members of this committee who are going to be standing. And then I look at you and I think to myself, you're just a youngster. Um, <laughs> you've got a lot of years under your belt. There's no reason why you should be retiring at all. Um, and I really regret that because the County Council is going to miss you tremendously. I know your career has been in local government, but we've only had that benefit for the last six years. But you have made a tremendous contribution to the department. You've run it in a calm, logical way. And I know that the staff and indeed we as councillors will miss you tremendously. You've always been there for us. You've always offered us sound, logical advice. We could pick up the phone and you would always answer us. So I'm, I will miss you personally, and I'm sure many of all of the councillors uh, will feel the same. We've got used to the way we're working, but for today, I very much wish instead of looking at you all on the screen and seeing your individual rooms, it would have been nice if we could have all been together to wish you, Chris, a very happy, active uh, and healthy retirement as you row away into the future. Um, we will miss you and I do hope that it won't be the end of our respective relationships. I do hope that when times return to normal, we can all meet again, the team of 2021, and say goodbye to you uh, personally, in w wherever that may be. I have in mind Hailing Island, because I think that's close to where you live now. So Chris, thank you for what you have done this committee, the whole council, owes you a tremendous debt of gratitude. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Lance. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to Hailing Island. You're welcome uh, um, for everybody to come on down here. Um, Chris, I sit on the Langston Harbour Board in the Chichester Harbour Conservancy. And I understand, do I understand correctly, you've got a stand up paddle board? Um, well, I've got a kayak, actually. Um, a I've, kayak? I've... Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, well, if you're only semi-retiring, um, I've been approached by Border Force, and I understand they're recruiting enforcement officers. So in your kayak, if you're interested um, <laughs> in arresting illegal immigrants and uh, arresting smugglers of weapons and drugs, um, then after planning, it will really be... <laughs> much less stressful so let me know if you need a second career and you're always welcome to land at Haley Island. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Lance. Mark you've got your hand up. Uh, thank you Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, when, when, I'm at, when I'm at district council planning meetings I sometimes get the feeling that officers and, and councillors are at odds with each other uh, and the officers are always battling to protect their recommendations. Uh, that's not the case with the county planning officers under the leadership of uh, Chris Murray. Uh, Chris usually intervenes uh, late on in a planning debate, taking councillors' concerns uh, seriously and adapting the recommendations to meet their concerns. His tone is always conciliatory, uh, calm uh, and authoritative. Uh, the result is that the officers are happy with an amended recommendation and the councillors feel that their concerns have been addressed satisfactorily. And, and that's a very real scale, skill, chair, very rare skill, Chairman. And consequently, uh, Chris Murray will be missed uh, very significantly by the County Council. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. D Lisa, did you want to come in and say anything? I would actually. Thank you, Councillor Latham. Um, I just wanted to say something on behalf of officers, really, um, and so, so everybody can hear it on on, on the record. Um, and I didn't want this moment to pass by because Chris has made such a um, 
you know a big impact on um, strategic planning since he's been with us. Um, as you, as uh, Councillor Latham has mentioned, he joined us in um, in 2015, so he's been with us for six years, and in that time has done such a lot to help officers develop and support, and given us such an amazing amount of guidance um, that I think we'll be eternally grateful. And I, I wanted members to be aware of that if they weren't all already, which I think you already are. I mean, there's been some significant changes on the development management side and that has been due to Chris coming in and challenging how we do things. When, when he came in, we've been doing things uh, the same way for a number of years. We, we, you will recall we had a number of um, you know, previous officers who've been doing the job for a long time. Chris came in, he challenged everything. He got officers um, to challenge everything. And I really think we've benefited from all of that encouragement and support that he has given us. I'd also like to just say personally that I'm going to miss Chris an enormous amount. Um, he's just been such a fantastic manager to have. And I know other officers within the development management team that you see in committee, indeed in Melissa's team in planning policy and in the wider strategic planning section, they will feel exactly the same. And thankfully, we've got another month of him. So we've, we've got more time to say goodbye than, than you have today. Um, and just finally, um, obviously, there's been some, you know, alluding to Chris rowing off as he kayaks off. I would say into the sunset. Um, I just hope you know, Chris, how, what such a valued um, person you are to us all as officers and how much we will really miss you. So thank you for everything. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Chris, I think you've heard just how much we all value you. We will all miss you very much and I hope we will see you. We won't, we haven't seen the last of you and we'll see you later on in the summer. Chris, is there anything you would like to respond to? Yes, please. Uh, thank you all. That's most unexpected. Uh, um, I um, I just want to thank you, Peter, and the whole of the committee for your support that, that you've given me and the team um, while while I've been in post here. It's been much appreciated. Um, and I want to thank you really for the whole committee for your measured and well-considered contributions in the meetings. Um, that isn't always the case, I can assure you. I know some of you were involved in other meetings. I won't name any names, but I've, I've got quite experience of doing <laughs> other committees around the county. Uh, often uh, unnecessarily confrontational, I think, as, as uh, Mark um, uh, hinted at. Um, so I, I would like to thank you for your, for your contributions. It, it's all about working together to get the right outcomes for our, our community. Um, and I always tell the, the junior officers that one of the best parts of, of doing this job is actually working with committee, working with members to, to get the right outcomes. Um, it's, it is very much, um, for me, has been you know, the most enjoyable part of the job. Uh, and I mean that sincerely. Some people raise their eyebrows when I say that, but I genuinely mean that. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that I'm leaving uh, with you in, in very safe and capable hands. Um, as you've seen today, I hope you would all agree, very professional, thorough um, presentations from the team. So, um, you know, the, there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that um, you've got a very strong team that will uh, support you as a committee, you know, in the future. Um, and I, I hope you would all agree with that. Um, I'd like to just thank James and Katie as well, just very briefly, uh, and their colleagues in support committee. They do a great job keeping us all uh, on track and making sure that we, we do things correctly, uh, and we follow the right processes, etc. So thank you to them. And, and finally, really just, uh, you know, again, a big thank you to all of you and best wishes for the future. Um, good luck in the elections if you're, if you're standing again. Um, and although I'm retiring from this formal role, I, I do want to keep, keep active. Uh, you never know, I might pop up, pop, pop up at some point in the future in a role similar to the ones that you're all doing. So, um, yeah, just watch this space. You never know. Thank, thank you all. Thank you, Chris. Right. I, I think we've, I think it's now time to close the, uh, the meeting formally. Thank you once again for all your support and best of luck to all of us in the coming elections. Chairman, yes. Chairman, before we go, I'm sorry, I know it's a bit after the Lord Mayor's show, but it, uh, and I echo everything that's been said, but there's somebody who's been missed in all of this, and actually that's you. 
uh, and uh, and it is right for uh, for members, I think, and it's uh, it's the normal case at the end of uh, of any municipal year for the committee to thank the chairman <coughs> and the vice chairman for everything that they've done over the last uh, 12 months and longer and longer. So thank you to you, chairman, for the way you've uh, chaired these meetings. I have to say. The challenge of chairing the meetings in person is one thing. Chairing them remotely must be an even greater challenge, and you've risen to it. You've been outstanding. Uh, the other thing is I'm very pleased that you've got Lance alongside you. He's always cheerful and, uh, and terrific and uh, probably the greatest champion for Hailing Island I think I've ever heard. <laughs> and, uh, and also prior to that, Judith as well, on my time on this committee, his last four years has literally flown by, and the quality of the contributions from members and without you know, means officers has been outstanding so thank you very much chairman for everything that you've done thank you Stephen Chris you want to just I see your well yes uh, Stephen has just really said what I wanted to say um, we've, we've, we've had some difficulties with um, chairmanship of regulatory so sometime back in the past but I just wanted to Thank you, Peter, and indeed Lance, for for the to, for the way the the committee uh, um, and for, for way you've handled things during the last four years. I think it's been exceptional. So thank you very much for that. Just one other small item to to advise you. I have had an email in from Neville Penman to tell tell me that he has been in the committee. He has he has been attending. Thanks, Chris. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you to everybody. Hopefully I'll see a lot of you on the other side in June. Take care. Peter, there's one thing that you missed. Ah, what was that? Which is that it is the tradition that at the end of the whole cycle, the chairman buys everyone a drink. <laughs> uh, so I'm just I'm just waiting for the drink to be served. I don't know whether you've got a delivery or something.